Uh, hi everyone, my name is Željko Troglić. I'm uh, working with Java for like 20 years and last year and a half uh, I'm doing the backend applications in Kotlin. So yeah, first I'm uh, thankful to Peter uh, that he made such a nice uh, introduction to the programming langu language so it will make uh, job a bit easier for me. So. Uh, uh, we, you probably heard about the Kotlin programming language. Language it seems that only a couple of people worked with it. So, can you raise a hand? Did you heard about the Kotlin language? Yeah. Okay. Uh, who is uh, using it for something that's not Android? Okay, two people, great. So most of people are using for the Android development. And uh, it seems it's kind of a uh, 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 public opinion that it's mostly used for the Android development. Okay, so this, it's this, is my, this is my alarm that I should start the presentation, so I'll just stop it, sorry for that. <laughs> so. Okay. I hope now I spent my uh, pool of uh, of uh, failures for this presentation, so the rest will uh, be just fine. So, uh, why is Kotlin so popular in, in uh, for Android development? Uh, maybe because uh, if you go like a year and a half ago, uh, Android was still on the Java 6, so there were some extensions, but Basically, you couldn't use all the nice features that you have in today's modern languages like, you know, lambdas, streams, etc. So it was a really big gain uh, for the Android community. However, uh, Android uh, Kotlin was made as a general purpose programming language, so you can do it for, you use it for just about anything. So, uh, what is the Kotlin's appeal for the backend programming? Uh, Apart from usual stuff, uh, you know, it's multi-paradigm, you can do object or functional or combined programming or, or whatever. It's very expressive. It means that you don't have to type a lot to have some, uh, some working code. Um, it's safe. Uh, you heard in the previous presentation about the null safety. It has a really good interoperability interoperability in Java. You can basically take Java project, convert just one class or two in the same folder, two classes and compile it and everything will work. You can call Kotlin from Java, Java for Kotlin, instantiate objects, whatever. Uh, those of you who tried some uh, predecessors like Scala know that this interoperability is not always very easy, but in Kotlin case it's quite simple to do that. And it also has uh, a great framework integration. So you saw some stuff like extension functions, DSL and stuff, uh, and uh, the frameworks, popular frameworks today are already using uh, this to great extent. I'll show you some examples later. So, um, how many people are here are doing backend programming with Java? Can you raise hands, please? Okay. It seems quite a lot. So I have a small question, uh, a small quiz for you for a start. So let's say that you have a class. And this class has a person property, which is of type person. So how many times you have to write word person in your class to have a person property? Can you give me some numbers? Hmm? You have like, you know, person, person, which is public, etc. getters, setters, no? Okay, is it less than five? More than five, less, this, the less than 10? Ah, could be around 10. Okay, we'll return to this uh, later. So, uh, first I will show you some uh, cool things that you can do with the Kotlin and later uh, I will explain you how to do that in your own applications. So if you're creating uh, entity class with Kotlin, it's much, much shorter uh, than with pure Java. So what you will typically do, uh, you will declare a class and then immediately after the class name, you will write uh, so-called default constructor. So 
this is the constructor that will be always always used. Even you, if you write uh, another constructors, they will always call this one. And in this constructor, you can declare not just some parameters to the constructor, but so writing it like this will be a parameter. But if you put a var on or val in front of it, then it becomes a property. So uh, by writing var id int, you are creating uh, id property, you are creating the getters for it, and you are creating the setters for it. So the whole set. Um, what else is interesting here? Yeah, you can also de declare the class as the data class, and this will give you some more functionality. So the data class will automatically get some, uh, will get two string equals and hash code methods. However, if you're creating the entities, I will recommend to to um, check the equals and hash code because you will probably uh, need a slightly uh, different implementation. Okay, so um, another thing that you uh, can uh, write in in uh, a better way in Kotlin are uh, those you know service controllers, uh, controller um, uh, enterprise bin classes. Uh, however, which framework is calling it? So here again, I'm declaring a class and. Uh, Again, I'm using this default constructor, so I will not inject the uh, values into the properties later, but rather I will do this immediately during the construction. And this is a much better way uh, to do this in, in Kotlin. Uh, I explain also this a bit later. And here I have one method which accepts the, the post request with some data and then stores this data into the database. And uh, in Kotlin, you if you have a a function that is just an expression, so it does not have complicated control flow. You can uh, write it like this. This is a short way. So you just write the equal sign and the expression. You don't even have to write the return type because it will be deducted automatically from the expression. However, I would recommend to write it because if you get something unsuspected here, then the compiler will warn you because of the type mismatch. So, uh, here I uh, took this data that I got from the HTTP. Uh, it's a, it probably came as a JSON and then was uh, parsed and filled into the object. And then I'm calling the let function. Let is used for the conversion of the value. So I will convert this value, which comes as it, inside to an entity class. And then I can say also, so do also something else with this. So I will uh, save it to the database, and then uh, uh, at the end I will convert it to its own ID to return it to the caller, so the caller has the ID. Note that Kotlin also supports uh, operator uh, overloading, so you can define your own operators. So if you are uh, creating a, um, a rep repository for accessing the database, you can use plus, minus, etc. to add and remove data. So uh, in my opinion, it's much um, readable if you have operators instead of method names, because if you have method names, then everything is just letters and dots and letters and dots. And here is more obvious uh, what you meant. Uh, contrary to some other languages, you can uh, define only the standard operator. So you, you cannot invent your own. And that's also good because in some languages, they really went uh, uh, over the board with this and, and, and uh, created some monstrosities that no one could uh, understand. Okay, this is how uh, your uh, components will look like. Okay, and uh, the last uh, way how Kotlin can uh, help you with, with, with the coding is um, are the uh, parameter names. So when you uh, want to map a class to, to, to JSON, for example, and, and convert it with JSON to something else. Uh, or any other case when you have uh, mapping between something outside of Java and the Java object, you have to put some annotations. And in these annotations, you uh, usually have to repeat the name. So I have a JSON 
which has a name property. And I have a Java class, which has a name property. And uh, there is no way this, that these two can be matched, but rather I have to write name once more here. So uh, why is that? By default, Java does not store the names of the uh, constructor and method parameters into the class files. So a uh, framework cannot use that data to do the automatic mapping because it's not there. However, Kotlin stores it so it can be used by framework and then you can remove all this stuff and write it just like this. And the framework can uh, figure out that this is called name, this is called cuteness and it will uh, go in and find those parameters in JSON file. Okay, another example would be if you are uh, writing again some HTTP processing, uh, maybe the user called the server with some URL which contains some uh, uh, query parameters like here. So in, uh, in Java you have to write name and weight and in uh, Kotlin you don't have to, you, you can just remove that part. Uh, also, um, note that in from Java 8, it's actually possible to add a special compiler uh, parameter. It's dash parameters, which will also um, add this information to the class files. Okay, so uh, now we, we uh, saw how the Kotlin can improve our server-side code, but um, it's not really... Uh, that's easy to do it immediately. There are a couple of things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing the conversion. So here I show one of those uh, uh, you know, awful entity beans. So you have to write down all the properties and then for each property uh, I have some constructors and here for each property you have a getter and setter and two string and equals and hot shot blah 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 and by the size of this slider on the scroll bar you see how uh, much code is is below, so this is just tip of the iceberg. And yeah, so if you have um, ID like IntelliJ, you can just press the keyboard combination. I think it's Control Alt Shift K for Kotlin, and it will convert your Java class to the Kotlin. Uh, so when you do the conversion, you have to do a couple of things more. So you can remove all the getters and setters and all the other stuff that's automatically provided by uh, by the data class. Uh, however, you will miss one thing, and that's the parameterized constructor. So framework needs a way to instantiate uh, uh, the entity bean. So th the bean is first instantiated, and then its properties are populated with the values. Um, and yeah, it's like, um, it, it, it ruins things a bit, does it? Ah, doesn't look good. So you also have to provide some values to, default values to fill in uh, those uh, strings above. Okay, and yeah, if you have some values that are not nullable, like this name, then you have to provide the empty string, also very ugly. But there is a better way to do it, and actually you don't have to write this ever, because there is another cool trick in the sleeve, and those are the Kotlin compiler plugins. So uh, there is a way how uh, Kotlin com uh, generates Java bytecode from the Kotlin source file. With the compiler, you can change how the classes are generated. So uh, here is one example. Uh, let's say that you want to add the parameterless constructors to some set of classes automatically. So in that case, you can use the noarg plugin, and then you can you configure to which classes you want to add the parameterless, uh, parameterless constructor, but not exactly to the classes, um, but to specify annotations. And if the class is annotated, with this annotation, it will automatically get a parameterless constructor. So if it's, a, if it's a some uh, kind of HTTP uh, controller or if it's some kind of, of um, session bean, uh, it will automatically get parameterless constructor. There is also predefined, uh, there is also this JPA plugin, which basically does the same, but it has the predefined set of annotations. So the JPA knows which classes from the Java Persistence API uh, need a parameterless constructor and it will add it 
automatically. This, this example uh, is for uh, uh, Gradle, and you have also, uh, all, all these features also uh, in, Maven, uh, in Maven Kotlin plugin. Okay, so now comes the tough part. Uh, the if you just uh, write your class, uh, uh, your um, session uh, bean or or or, or um, a Spring component on or, or, or whatever in Kotlin, it will not work because if you are using with these frameworks, they can only work with the classes that are not final, because they must extend those classes. So. Uh, I give you an example. Let's say that you are using with Spring Framework and uh, you have some um, service and that service uh, handles transactions and it handles maybe uh, um, authorization, so it checks who can access the method, etc. So how it works on the framework level? The framework takes your class and it wraps it with another class which extends the original class. So whenever you call your class, you're actually calling a wrapper and you enter the method, the wrapper opens the transaction, checks, uh, okay, first checks maybe the authorization, opens the transaction, and then calls your original method. And when it returns, um, then uh, the wrapper closes the transaction and uh, comes back to your original call. That's why is it necessary. And uh, designers of, of uh, Kotlin decided to make all classes final final and public. This is the difference between Kotlin and Java. So why they will do that? Um, apparently they read effective Java a lot and uh, one of the recommendations there is uh, make class, design class for extension or make it final. So all classes are final unless you design it so it can be extended and then you will uh, declare it as open. So, if you want uh, uh, your Kotlin class to work uh, with the framework, you have to open everything. So, first you have to make class non-final, so it can be extended, and then each and every method should be also declared open, so it can be uh, overridden by this wrapper. And again, this is um, a lot of work, and it's not very elegant, so we have yet another compiler plugin. This time it's called All Open. And uh, similar to the previous one, it also can be configured with uh, annotations, or you have some predefined uh, 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 plugin configurations. So if you put Kotlin dash Spring, then it will automatically open all classes that has to be opened by by uh, a Spring framework uh, needs. Cool. So. Now we solve a couple of problems. Let's move on. Uh, now, these days, if you want to uh, use the services of other class, you will not instantiate it directly, but rather the framework will provide it to you. You will use dependency injection, a version of control, however is it called. And you will just say, okay, I have this service, which is of type service, and it's, it should be ejected if you are in the Java E world or out of wired if you are in the Spring world. And uh, then later I will take this uh, reference and I will call a persist method on the reference. But again, it will not work. Uh, because uh, of the way how these uh, classes are uh, initialized by the f by the framework. So um, if you have to reference some class uh, via dependence injection, so what what your framework do? It will first create an instance of the class, so the constructor will be executed. Then it will inject the values in the class, and then the class will be given to you. So one uh, of unfortunate side effects of that is that in the constructor you cannot access any of these injected values because they're not injected yet. That, that happens only after the class construction. So uh, most frameworks have something like this. So you have a post-construct annotation. Uh, 
you write yet another method and declare it as post-construct and it will be executed after the injection and here you can use these values that were injected. So, yeah, a bit inconvenient. This means that, first of all, uh, this in the, this first line, service must be nullable. So you construct the object, this value is null, and then you do the injection. So there is a moment in time where this value is null. Second, of second thing, it will be changed, because initially it was null, and then it gets some value. So it cannot be a val, which means a constant value, but it must be a var. So yeah, it's a bit clumsy, but OK. Uh, so the thing that will work is this. It must be var. It must be nullable. You must assign a null value at the beginning. And uh, each and every time when you're calling something on that reference, you must handle the possible null value of it. So you said, OK, service can be null. And Kotlin says, fine, but if you want to call something on that reference, then please tell me what should I do if it's null. And the compiler will, will not let you to just write service.persist. So as I know that this value will be always injected by the framework and I couldn't be bothered, I write, wrote just a simple uh, null handling. So two exc exclamation marks uh, is basically the same as Java. You tell to the compiler, OK, uh, I claim that this never will be null. And if it is null, then just throw the exception. So basically, you are, you are uh, working around the Kotlin uh, null uh, handling, which is not uh, good. Uh, so Kotlin has one uh, cool modifier for the variables. You can declare them as let init. Let init means, OK, I know that this variable is, is uh, now null, but I claim that before the first use, it will for sure have some value. But that's your claim. And the uh, compiler says, OK, if you say so, I will not do this null checks on the reference, and you can call your methods uh, without any checks as much as you like. So yeah, this, this simplifies uh, things a lot. It's still, uh, still a variable, but at least the rest of the code will look uh, uh, normally. And uh, uh, this is the best way to, uh, for example, get a reference to Entity Manager. So you write at persistent context, you let in it Entity Manager, and use it later. But for other um, managed objects that I um, injected into the class, there is one even better way. And that's construct injection which I showed at the beginning, and, and as you can see, this is the most natural way to inject uh, uh, references into the class, because now you don't have to say it's nullable, you uh, uh, don't have to put it's viral because it's not, it's, it's, um, it will be just assigned once. And best of all, it's available in constructor. You don't need any at post construct annotations or whatever, you can just use it later. So uh, now when we solve these uh, basic th things, how to make Kotlin classes work uh, nicely with the frameworks, we are ready to go to the next level, to actually get some goodies from the frameworks that, that, that we will not get if we are using, using just the plain Java. So if you're using the Spring frameworks, uh, framework, it's um, uh, well integrated with Kotlin null, null processing. So um, most of the methods in the framework are quite extensively annotated. I think it's JSR 305 annotations, which say, OK, does this method return null, or does it not? Uh, can it return null, or it's always some value? And uh, Kotlin compiler can use those annotations from Java and conclude IO uh, uh, values nullable or not, and then it knows should it warn you about the nulls or not. Uh, null information goes both way. So if you are writing a Kotlin class and you declare, uh, for example, HTTP parameter as uh, non-nullable, 
then the Spring will read this information, and if the parameter is not sent in HTTP request, it will re uh, generate 400 bad requests to the client. So it works both, both ways. And uh, the Spring also provides two uh, DSLs for easier configuration. This came with uh, uh, Spring 5. First is the bin DSL. So um, if you are working with Spring and declaring some beans, then you know it's a lot of you know, register bean functions, etc. And you can do it in a nicer way with this uh, domain-specific language. So uh, by using all these features that were explained in the previous presentation, so you have those extension functions, etc., you can create a DSL for this. So you just uh, write something that looks more like, uh, you know, configuration file or, or, or JSON or whatever. Uh, you open the curly braces and then you have some, some structure with, uh, which describes the configuration of the Spring application. Um, the second DSL is the WebFlux DSL. This is a uh, quite new thing. So uh, with Spring um, uh, 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 5 and, and, and um, uh, Spring Boot to the Toe, we got the, those reactive APIs for doing the HTTP stuff. Uh, but it, they are not as easy to configure as uh, uh, previous MVC frameworks. So here you have to call some methods, etc., to configure the router. Uh, with this DSL, you can just, you know, open the, the router, define how uh, HTTP calls map to functions, and and uh, that's it. So here, for example, if we got something that's uh, text HTML and it's a GET request that comes to users, we will call find all view method on, on user handler uh, object. Okay, it's, uh, yeah, if you, if you look at it for, for a bit, it's quite self-descriptive. Good, so I work for, uh, uh, with the Kotlin for a year uh, and a half and uh, it's kind of hard to me to go back to Java because uh, of all these uh, uh, nice uh, not um, nice features that Kotlin have, especially regarding the functional programming, uh, also because of the of the null uh, null safety and all these uh, other additions, and uh, because the, the code is is much shorter, it, I feel that uh, I am more efficient by writing the code. Um, and also the good thing is that with some when, when the, the backend team was overloaded, we could get some help also from the frontend team because uh, the Kotlin is quite similar to some other languages. So if you know TypeScript or if you know Swift, uh, you will probably know like you know 80% of Kotlin because I think that all those languages are quite similar. Uh, so the question is, okay, I show you all the features, so uh, is it worth switching to uh, Kotlin now? Because Java is, is trying to catch up uh, with some features. So in Java 8, we got this uh, parameters, uh, compiler param parameter, which adds metadata, and Java 9 introduced some additional stream functions, like take file, while or file, I think, so it's easy to work with streams. And in... Uh, Java 10, we will, it will not be necessary anymore to declare the variable type. You could just write var for a local variable and uh, the type will be inferred for you. But those are just a couple of features. If you take a look at other features that the Kotlin provides, I think it's very uh, worthwhile, worthwhile, worthwhile uh, proposal. So what I especially like are uh, extension and inline functions, so you can add function uh, to any class, even the one ones that in some external libraries and add some functionality of yours. You can inline fu functions, which is uh, mm, uh, cool not just for performance, but it uh, gives you some additional uh, tricks with uh, generic generic types. Operate, operate in overloading is also great, and I uh, like that uh, some uh, statements are actually functions. So with uh, if statement you or with the, with the try catch or when you can assign a value to a variable. For example, you can say 
val message equals try call some stuff, catch uh, get uh, message from the exception, and then it will be assigned to the variable. It's it's uh, more obvious what that block does because it starts with variable equals something. So it's obvious that the sole purpose of the block of code is to provide value to the variable. Good. So how to start with the Kotlin? Okay, the first step will be, of course, to edit your build scripts. Uh, and, uh, and then try with some unit tests. That's not a production code, so it should be quite easy. Uh, try to play uh, with the language a bit, and then try to convert to production uh, class and uh, and have fun. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more about this, uh, you can go to my blog. It's zelko.link. Here is a three-part series about converting Java E application uh, to Kotlin, and it has uh, links to my GitHub repository, so you can uh, see some real code examples in simple applications. Okay, so there is one thing left unanswered from the beginning, and that's how many times you have to write a person if you want to create a person property in a Java class, and whoever said 10 was right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You have to write ten times. In Kotlin, you will just write var person, colon person, so two times, and you are instantly five times more productive. So, yeah, thank you all. You are a great audience. If you have some. <laughs> yeah. If you have some additional questions, we have like a minute. So <laughs> Anyway, it's a coffee break, so I'm available. Uh, with Lombok, no. Yeah, that's another way to make Java class shorter. So instead of using uh, Kotlin, you can also use uh, Lombok annotations. But uh, I think that that Kotlin provides more functionality. But I didn't use Lombok, so I I don't know how complicated it is. Okay, we return back at 4 p.m. Same place.